Hello, I wanted to talk to you about a subject that perplexes me, um, which is the law and how it relates to digital technology and the internet. Now, I know, or I assume I know, most of the laws that govern my everyday existence and that are pertinent to me. Um, I know that it's wrong to harm people, to rob and steal, uh, to drive without a motoring license, to commit crimes in, of that order. And people that break those laws, I regard as criminals. Um, people who knowingly break a law um, are clearly committing a criminal act. Um, but some people break laws um, knowingly because they either disagree with them or they imagine that the advantages of breaking them outweigh the chances of being caught committing that crime and when that happens um, whether you sympathize with that person's actions or not um, there are degrees of criminality within the act um, a bank robber who knowingly steals money um, because he thinks that the length of prison sentence he might obtain is worth the risk of obtaining all that wealth is clearly a more serious criminal than a driver who drives at five miles per hour over the speed limit um, when he knows that the speed limit is a certain limit um, but still wants to get home a little bit faster and thinks that he can escape the speed cameras and then there are other laws that are broken because people think they need to be changed um, example might be something like smoking cannabis um, which some people think should be legalized um, but they smoke it under a regime which um, deems it to be an illegal act and then you get a final category which are laws that um, people are unaware of and then break the law without even knowing that they've done so done so um, a case in point might be um, crossing a, a road um, in a country where jaywalking is illegal when um, you're perfectly accustomed to being allowed to cross the road at any point and take the risk upon yourself in your own country. So what I want to put to you is that um, in the past couple of decades, the rise of digital technology and the appearance of the internet um, have not only increased um, the opportunities for people to commit crime but also for them to unwittingly commit crimes um, because the whole legal situation is so unclear um, there's a very obvious crime committed when people commit internet fraud um, identity theft that kind of thing um, but it's another matter when people transgress uh, rules that they're not entirely sure about. So for instance, digital technology makes it much easier to copy things, um, to copy documents, to copy music. Um, but when does that copying actually become a breach of copyright? Um, in some instances, uh, video piracy, for instance, um, is very obvious, but um, if you record something off of the television um, and then keep that recording for your um, in your own library to watch in the future, are you actually 
breaking the law? I don't know. I mean, it's just a case in point. This has a particular bearing on YouTube. Um, I haven't had my own YouTube channel for very long. Um, but uh, one of the things I would like to do is emulate a number of um, uh, YouTube channels that I subscribe to. Um, and this is one of them, British Legion, um, whose videos I really enjoy. Um, but in this particular video, um, if you look it up, he talks about having been, um, having had a strike against him and being obliged to remove one of his videos. Um, I can't remember it, so I can't say exactly why he had a problem, but um, it related to Dad's army um, and some kind of complaint that he'd breached their copyright, um, which may be because the uh, film of Dad's army has just been released and film studios were particularly touchy about their ownership of the copyright to the title name or um, I don't know the images it's just I'm just unsure but um, the worrying thing is that uh, as he himself says is he's not entirely sure what it was that he did wrong um, and having um, had the strike um, there's a risk that his channel will be cut completely. Um, I've, I've looked this up since, because you can um, find this in the YouTube regulations, and um, he doesn't need to worry as much as he has done, because the strike is removed after six months. Um, it, so he'll go back to having a clean slate after six months, as long as he doesn't get another strike in that time period. Um, but the thing about his films are that uh, he often does have music on them, clips from uh, cinema, films, that kind of thing. Um, and is, is he using those in an illegal way? Um, I don't know. But um, I worry that um, if I were to copy his style in some way, I might get into trouble myself. Now, another YouTube channel that um, I really enjoy watching is Lindy Beige. And he goes one step further in that he will often feature quite long lengths of a TV program or a, or a cinema movie and comment on it and criticise it in particular for its historical accuracy. Um, so in this example here, he's uh, produced a really um, entertaining video about the recent TV series The Last Kingdom and the kind of atrocious uh, historical mistakes and anachronisms that they got in the film. So, for instance, in this clip here, um, I don't know how he does it. I, I don't even know how he manages to copy um, onto YouTube clips from um, the TV version of The Last Kingdom. But um, you can see what he's done here is he's highlighted in red all the thatch work on the roof um, and pointed out that it's totally um, ineffective um, in terms of a weathering material for a roof that it's too thin um, and doesn't serve its purpose um, and he's, he's, it's full of things like that you know comments on why have they got burning torches in the daylight why are they wearing those ridiculous leather garments uh, that anachronistic knitwear um, why aren't they carrying the right kinds of shields, all those sort of things. He, he does it in a really funny, really entertaining way. Um, but my point really is, is he breaching any kind of copyright? Um, I, I don't think he is because um, you are allowed to show clips from films if you're using them to critique um, or using them for some other purpose. But um, 
that's that's a law which might apply in one country and not another and youtube is an international uh, phenomenon um so something that you might be allowed to do in america you may be forbidden from doing in in the uk or in europe um and that means that youtube have to really write their own set of rules and then cope with um geographical uh differences in interpretation and i have actually attempted to view some things on youtube and received a message that um it's going it's been made um impossible to view that particular clip in in the area in which i live um which implies that if i lived in america for instance i might be able to watch it the reason this concerns me in particular is that um I'm really keen to make my own little um, YouTube documentary about this film, uh, Zulu, which is uh, a film um, that you may well be aware of, uh, starring Michael Caine and Stanley Baxter, that was made in the very early 1960s. And um, I have an awful lot to say about this film. Um, it, it's... Uh, a really enjoyable film that uh, I have very fond memories of seeing when it was first released in the cinema and um, I really want to do a little piece on um, the historical accuracy of the film or lack of it, um, the background um, of the 1960s when it was made uh, the situation in South Africa, in the UK, um, in the film industry in America, um, all that kind of thing. And um, I can't even begin to do it. I can't find any software that allows you to copy the, um, the DVD, um, which suggests to me that um, it's bordering on an illegal act to do that anyway. Um, I'm worried that uh, were I to put that kind of footage onto uh, YouTube, even though I wouldn't be playing it as the film, I would be playing it as a background to my um, commentary, um, I would still transgress the kind of ruling that um, forced British Legion to take their video off of the channel. And um, one of the things that uh, YouTube do um, state in their guidelines is that even though you see someone else doing something, don't assume that they have the right to do it. Um, so don't copy other people's infringements is basically what they're saying and there are lots of uh, occasions when you search for the film Zulu or Rourke's Drift, The Battle of Rourke's Drift or Isambuana on YouTube you will find um, that people have simply ripped scenes from this film and put it onto their channels. Now are they doing that knowing that they're breaking some kind of regulation, some kind of copyright law? Um, or are they doing it simply because they think it's uh, valuable material that should be out, out there um, for wider consumption? Um, this is a case in point. Uh, this is a documentary about the making of the film of Zulu. And this, is, this has simply been lifted from the DVD um that accompanies that uh box set that i just showed you um so it's a really interesting documentary that i had to pay for um that in fact i could actually have downloaded for free from youtube um now has that been done deliberately to break the law or has it been done inadvertently whilst breaking the law um, is the maker of this channel gaining anything commercially from having done it? Has, is his channel free to view? 
well yes it is free to view but what i mean is has he monetized it is there advertising on it from which he makes a small amount um is he being subsidized through patreon um is there a difference if he if he, he does make a commercial gain from it than if he put it up um and just allow people to watch it um again i don't know these are all questions i don't have the answer for um but let me give you another example this is a youtube channel where someone has um copied a tv program um a series of programs called secrets of the dead and this one dealt with um the battle of Isandlwana. um now there are um, experts commenting during this TV program um, there is footage that presumably um, has copyright on it that belongs to the TV station that produced it originally if I remember rightly it was Channel 4 um, but I, I, I have lots of TV programs in my own house um, that I've recorded off of TV onto video or onto DVD from years back and they do they don't include this program but they include programs like it um, I don't intend to broadcast them I have them for my own use um, but were I to broadcast them would I be breaking the law is this breaking the law um, you can't buy this commercially um, so the person who runs this YouTube channel is doing the public a service in my opinion um, I've managed to find things on YouTube uh, programs that I have very fond memories of from way back from the 1980s um, and I thought they were lost forever um, and there they are um, they're of great educational um, use and um, I think that regardless of whether this is breaking the rules and regulations of YouTube or the uh, country of origin or whatever um, this person is providing a useful service to the public by making this available um, if he at the same time is also making money from it then I think that's a slightly different thing um, I think then he probably has got a um, case to answer um, against against the the, the the owner of this copyright um, but if it's just there free and uh, he's not making any profit from it then I think this is a perfectly viable thing to do um, but at the same time is he taking a risk is he likely to have his or her YouTube channel um, deleted uh, it's not a risk I want to take now when it comes to music and accompanying soundtracks to the YouTube channel it's it's another matter again it is it is even harder um, to be able to apply some kind of background music to any films you want to put up on YouTube um, than it is to um, rip movie scenes and put those on um, but that's something that a lot of channels again they do seem to be able to do and I can't find out how to do it um, all the music that you, you seem to be able to put on YouTube um, clips um, seems to be come from the, the, a library that YouTube offer um, and it's free to use um, some of it you have to acknowledge the uh, creator of the music um, and put the credit in your video but um, it is absolutely impossible it seems to me um, to be able to take a piece off of your own CDs or something like that and add it to to your own video um, but again some people seem to be able to do it are they are they actually breaking uh, copyright laws or not I suspect they're more likely to be breaking them in that case or is it or is it just that the music industry has a much tighter grip 
on copyright um, than the movie industry does. Um, again, I don't know. So as I said earlier, um, the, the opportunities to copy things and photograph things has increased enormously since digitization. Um, that it was one thing to carry a camera around with you um, when you visited places, but um, nowadays most people have uh, access to some kind of digital camera, um, be it, albeit on a smartphone, uh, some kind of camcorder, um, and that's that's created all kinds of conflicts of interest and and problems, as far as I can see. So it was it was once the case that if you took a camera into a public space, uh, an exhibition or art gallery or a place of historic interest, um, you normally um, would be informed by signs on the wall that photography was or wasn't allowed. Um, often if it was allowed then there was a, um, a prohibition on the use of flash photography um, because that was seen to damage the in particular um, fabrics or oil paintings, that kind of thing. Um, but now cameras are far less intrusive, so they don't require flash photography very often, and they're tiny, they're often just in your phone. Phones can take pictures of just as good quality as uh, an expensive camera in the old days. Um, and wherever you go, it seems the policy about photography differs enormously. Um, this is the website of the, the Reading Museum. And um, wherever I go, whichever museum I visit or art gallery I visit nowadays, especially now that I'm doing my YouTube channel, I always ask about the institution's policy on photography. Um, but very often, they will they will have a very clear cut policy and guidelines laid out on their website and the Reading Museum is a case in point where they have got things clarified um, and every I dotted and T crossed. So the Reading Museum have a page on their website um, that's titled About Us. And at the bottom of that page um, are a whole load of downloadable PDF documents, um, one of which deals with photographic policy. And this is the policy. It's a very thorough document, very well laid out, and uh, covers every eventuality. Um, the problem being that when you come to think about using images for YouTube, it is extremely restrictive. Um, you are allowed to take still photographs in most places in the museum, and if you're not, there is a very clear sign telling you so, so that you're left in no doubt as to what is allowed and what isn't. Um, but those photographs can only be used for personal enjoyment. They can't be placed in a public place, they can't be published, um, they can't be associated with any kind of advertising. Um, now I would have thought that all those things um, would could refer to YouTube. They're probably not, it probably wasn't written with with YouTube in mind. YouTube may not have even been in existence when they wrote this document. Um, but you can monetize your YouTube channel so that adverts appear beside it. Um, it is a public space, albeit a virtual space and not a, an advertising hoarding or something like that. Um, you're not um, using it as a slide in a public lecture but the public have access to your YouTube channel. So I would have said any still photography you take in that museum 
um, it can't be used on YouTube. But um, when you enter the, the museum, you're not supplied with a, a, um, a document discussing their photography policy. The only way you would know is if you had taken the trouble to look up their policy before you went or you asked at the door and in my experience every museum and art gallery that i've been to have entirely different policies on photography and filming um and yeah in in also i didn't point out but in the reading museum any kind of moving photography is not allowed and the reasons they give for that are primarily for security reasons. Um, so it's really at this point that I find the whole issue absolutely bewildering. So this is the um, photography policy of my local museum in Plymouth. Um, and again, it's available on the Plymouth Council's website, um, not so easy to find as the Reading one. Um, but they have a, 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 not a completely different, but they do have a different take on their policy. Um, you're readily permitted to take photographs in the public areas for your personal use, um, but not for commercial use. Now, it's some free, free entry into the museum, so the public have access to the things that you're going to take photographs of, but you are not presumably permitted to take a photograph of those items and then display them to those members of the public who could walk in and see them with their own eyes themselves. Um, it's slightly um, it, it just doesn't it doesn't make complete logical sense to me. And um, it mentions that uh, there are certain ex temporary exhibits, for instance, and ones items that they have on loan where you won't be permitted to take photographs because they don't have the copyright ownership of those items. Um, but I recently went to the museum to see a display um, related to Napoleon's um, uh, capture and his uh, stay in Plymouth Sound. Um, and I inquired about the photography policy and was told I couldn't take any still photographs of any of the items, partly because some of them were on loan um, and they weren't sure about the copyright but I was permitted to take a video film um, of the of the room from a distance which would be, would fly in the face of Reading's policy which doesn't permit any kind of video photography at all um, and the other thing that worries me is that um, when you visit these places, um, if you haven't previously um, investigated the websites of the institution and found out for yourself and read in black and white the policy, um, there's no guarantee that you're going to be given an accurate um, description of the policy by the member of staff that you ask at reception or in the room. Um, and I have frequently gone to places and been permitted to take film, um, to take still photographs, told there's no, absolutely no problem whatsoever. Um, but what, what would happen if that person had made a mistake and there had been a policy against filming? If I, if I then put an image up on YouTube, having got a verbal um, assent from the staff, could that image then be um, questioned by another member of staff who knew the policy more clearly and my YouTube channel 
threatened because I was obliged to remove that footage from my channel. So here is a case in point. This is the um, uniform that Nelson was wearing when he was mortally wounded at the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, and this uh, is on display at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, London. And when I entered the museum, I asked staff what their photography policy was and was told that still photography without the flash was fine, but video photography wasn't allowed. Um, and then I said, what happens if I take a still photograph with my video camera? And they said, that's fine, but a member of staff might approach you if she sees you panning the um, the camera just to make sure that you're only taking still photography. So I thought, great. Um, but I hadn't checked the policy and I still haven't. Um, so I haven't seen anything in writing. So does it say on that that the photography should only be for your personal use? I don't know. Um, is this no longer for my personal use now that I've placed it on my YouTube channel for you to look at? Um, would that change again were I to monetize my channel? I haven't into any intention of doing so, but um, is it okay whilst I show it to the public without making any kind of commercial gain? Would that change again if I were to monetize my channel? Um, and there's a lack of consistency here, even with the National Maritime Museum, um, because the National Maritime Museum also have a museum in Falmouth, down in Cornwall, which I visited recently. And there, when I inquired, it was fine to take video photography. But again, I haven't seen anything in writing. So is that video photography only intended for my personal use? Does my personal use extend to placing it on my personal YouTube channel for others to see? And would that change again were I to monetize my channel? Um, so there are items in the public domain that are owned by the public in public museums um, where you can't then display the images to the rest of the public um, and there's no consistency between one public place and another and when places aren't publicly owned um, there's still not a consistent policy. In fact, I don't know if the National Maritime Museum could be said to be publicly owned or not. Um, I suspect it must be financed from public funds, so presumably it is owned by the public. And uh, if you've seen my video on York, you, you'll know that I visited York recently and went in three separate places that are all run by the York Museum's Trust. Um, in the Yorkshire Museum, they had absolutely no issue with me taking still photography or video photography. Um, and I did it in front of members of the staff who were perfectly happy about it. Um, whereas in the Castle Museum, I was prohibited from taking video footage. And in the art gallery, I was told that they had never been asked whether it was okay to take video photography but they guessed it was. Um, so again if there's anything in writing anywhere I may have transgressed one or other of those institutions regulations and if I have done so um, am I at any risk of any kind of process against me for having put those images onto YouTube. Um, the whole thing is a is a minefield really and um, it's very easy to break the law um, without realising you're doing so and the repercussions of that 
are that you could lose your YouTube channel um, without having any redress or even really being told why that action had been taken against you. Now let's take this uh, logic to a to an extreme. Um, this is another institution in Plymouth. It's the National Marine Aquarium. Now the fact that they've got the word national in their title suggests to me that it's at least in part in public ownership, although you do have to pay admission. Um, if I were to go in there and take either a still or a moving image of a shark, say, um, that shark being in public ownership, could I then go home and publish that image on my YouTube channel? I would never in a million years consider that I couldn't. But what is the difference between that shark and a piece of art, a historic artefact, anything else, especially when they're all in the public domain? Um, if I would go even further and say um, film a caption describing um, the biology of the shark, its habitat, its feeding habits, etc., and then pan across to show an image of the shark, would then that be breaching some kind of copyright? Um, I, I, I think it's taking it to a level of absurdity, but I. I think there's a, there's a valid argument for saying that you should be free to film and image anything in any public place. These are the world famous Beth Chateau Gardens in Essex, um, privately owned, privately run, public pay admission to go in. Um, the gardens have been designed. So there's craft and artwork gone into them. Do the gardens own copyright on the images of their garden? And can anyone film them and then publish them? I showed you this image at the beginning of the film. Um, it's the Old Bailey in London, a public building, the outside of the building. Um, Last year sometime, I heard something that I didn't pay any attention to on the news that um, it's now illegal to film buildings, whether they're publicly owned or privately owned, um, without the owner's permission. Um, I'm not sure how true that is, but um, I'm beginning to think that it's quite possibly true and that everybody's breaking the law every time they get a camera out and film anything in public. So moving away from YouTube, but still on the subject of uh, copyright and digitization and digital processes. Um, I was told at the weekend, and um, I am in some doubt about this argument, but uh, the person that was debating this subject with me was quite convinced he was right, um, that this uh, wargaming figure that I own and painted myself um, is in breach of copyright regulations. And the reason that is, is that he's carrying a banner um, and he's a 28 mil figure. Um, now the banner I purchased um, as a 15 mil banner um, and obviously it's that's no use to me because I want it for a 28 mil figure so what I did was I scanned the banner um, turned it into a transfer um, placed that onto uh, some metal foil and in, sorry, enlarged it first of all, then placed it onto a, a metal uh, foil. And hey presto, I had the same banner, only in a larger scale. 
Now at the weekend, I purchased these uh, banners um, direct from the trader for the war game show in York. Um, they're 20 mil sized scaled banners and I require them for a 28 mil army. So I was intending to do the same thing again. And when I bought them, the um, trader was obviously interested because he's just uh, released this range of 20 mil figures that these banners go with and asked me if I played in 20 mil. And when I told him that what I intended to do with them, he was most upset and told me he would turn a blind eye to it, that I was uh, infringing his copyright ownership um, of these banners. Even though, incidentally, um, a lot of them are just the national flags of uh, the Mexican army. Um, I don't think any of them has actually created the designs. They're all copies of um, actual banners and actual flags that were carried during the Mexican Revolution. Um, but all the same, he claims copyright on the images. And even though I'm not intending to reproduce the images and sell them on, that would obviously be piracy. Um, and even though I'm never intending to use each of those individual flags in the size that he sold me to, them to me, um, he was most unhappy at what I intended to do with them. Um, and this is what I mean about how easy it is um, to break the law without knowing you're doing so. Um, because the technology is there now, digital scanners exist um, that can easily copy those images um, and they make it quite easy for um, criminals um, to pirate the image and sell it on. Um, but even if you're innocently um, thinking that you can use it in a perfectly legal way for your own use, um, you could still theoretically get in trouble with the law. Moving on again to another topic. Um, this is the cover of a set of naval wargaming rules that I own that I um, really admire. Um, they are an extremely dense set of rules, not difficult to play, but um, packed full of data and information and the authors quite rightly um, can be proud of them um, but also obviously own the intellectual property that they contain as well as um, being able to take credit for compiling all the data that the rules contain um, and that's includes um, a number of CDs that have data on them as well. So for instance, these two CD here um, contain details of every single ship um, that uh, was in the Royal British Royal Navy uh, between the years 1880 and 1945 including all the changes that were made to those ships whenever they came into harbour for a refit. Um, so it's truly an encyclopedic piece of work and um, I'm, I have no problems at all with them protecting their copyright as severely as they possibly can. Um, but the, the issue I have with these uh, rules and data are that they're compiled in the USA um, and they're very expensive to purchase um, and they obviously have to be shipped across the Atlantic. Um, now anything that goes across the Atlantic in the mail when it is over I think of the equivalent of about 18 pounds um, has to pay value-added tax 
when it enters the UK. Um, and on top of that tax, you also have to pay uh, something like an eight pound handling charge um, that's claimed by the post office for intercepting the mail and putting it through this process of being evaluated, taxed, and then the paperwork that accompanies all that work. Um, and again, I haven't really got a problem with that. Um, if you're going to buy something, a product from outside the EU, um, then the law states that you have to abide by the custom duties of the land. But my point is that all this data um, could be electronically um, messaged to me over the internet in the form of PDF files or what have you, Word documents, that kind of thing. Um, and if that were the case, it would never be intercepted. It would be the same value in terms of its commercial value um, as I had I bought it in hard copy and CD, but it would never be intercepted by customs. So I would never pay that extra VAT and the postal charge for it. Um, so the internet isn't isn't policed by taxmen in that in that respect, um, and that doesn't make sense. But are you breaking the law if you if you had it all sent to you electronically and then you printed it out in this manner in a folder like that in exactly the same way? Um, is that breaking the law? I don't think so, but um, it's illogical for them to um, charge for written material if it comes on paper when they don't do it if it comes on PDF file. Um, and heaven knows what's going to happen when 3D printers um, come into widespread use. Um, rather than buying something, a physical 3D object, and having it shipped, you buy the electronic data and print it out yourself. Um, and customs are going to lose out. So there we are, that's the end of my rant on the subject of the law and digital technology. Um, my own feelings are, are that the law is not keeping up with the rapid changes that are happening in our technology. And um, there's a, a clear and obvious danger from internet fraud and that kind of thing, um, phishing and scams and so on. Um, uh, but on top of that, there's a danger that innocent people are going to transgress rules and regulations simply because they're unaware of how they apply in the digital age. Um, so in particular, anyone out there watching who has their own YouTube channel, um, by all means, comment and uh, respond, telling me what your thoughts on the subject are. Um, in particular, I'll be interested to find out how people do um, put video images on onto their YouTube channels from movies and so on, TV programs, and whether there is any um, legal issue that those people are aware of. Um, so thanks for watching anyway. Please comment, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next video. Bye for now.